أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لئن بسطت إلي يدك لتقتلني ما أنا بباسط يدي إليك لأقتلك إني أخاف الله رب العالمين إني أريد أن تبوء بإثمي وإثمك فتكون من أصحاب النار وذلك جزاء الظالمين فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الرحم معلق على العرش وينادي كل يوم وليلة يا رب سل من وصلني وقطع من قطعني أو كما قال حميدا ومسليا ومتوكلا على الله وبعد Respected brothers and elders Alhamdulillah Thumma alhamdulillah Allah has blessed us And graced us To witness Another sacred month You may be aware that we have started The blessed and the sacred month of Rajab Today happens to be the third of Rajab The dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the sighting of the moon of Rajab used to be Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab wa Sha'ban wa balighna Ramadan which means O oh Allah make the months of Rajab and Sha'ban months of blessings for us and through the blessings of these months take us through the completion of Ramadan so in other words, so to say, our preparation for the glorious and the gracious month of Ramadan should start from now. Should start from now. As we are told by the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just, I would say, just a few days remaining. So start making your physical, mental, emotional, financial Preparations to witness and enter into the month of Ramadan to benefit from it at its maximum. The Prophet ﷺ says that anyone who informs others about the arrival of the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him for his sins. Just by informing a person, just by telling a person, just by giving the good news, uh, the bushra of the arrival of Ramadan to a person, and you do so with joy and happiness and jubilation, on that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive a person's sins. So I am doing this today to you, and I hope inshallah you do this to others. You give this good news of the coming of Ramadan to others and be there with happiness and joy and ecstatic to receive this month of Ramadan and let it be the best Ramadan you would have ever spent in your entire life so far. One of the things that we need to do is to correct our relationships with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also to correct our relationships with human beings. Because when the season of ibadah comes, we want to enter into that phase, we want to enter into that season with purity. We want to enter with our hearts being filled with love and not hatred and not enemy or animosity for anyone, for any individual. And it came to my attention for the last couple of weeks that, you know, when, because of being a scholar and an imam, people come to you and, 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 and share their issues and conflicts and problems. And one of the things had been family issues going on. Issues with relatives, issues with kit and kins, conflicts, arguments. So I've decided today, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to speak a little bit on, on our relationship with each other, 
from an aspect of family members. How should we deal with our relatives, family members? Whether it be siblings, whether it be our kitten kins, whether it be our children, whether it be parents, whether it be whatever facet it, it be from our family, how do we deal with them? Right? One is to one is to give sadaqah. When a person gives sadaqah to someone, then you receive the reward of the sadaqah given. But when you give sadaqah to a needy family member, when you give sadaqah to a needy family member, then you have twofold rewards. Number one, you're giving sadaqah to somebody who is needy, fine, alhamdulillah. Allah will reward you. But when you, when you take care of family members, right? And for example, you give sadaqah to family members, the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah will reward you with double rewards. One is the reward by itself for the sadaqah, and the second is the reward for maintaining family ties. Family ties. What is the message of the Qur'an when dealing with family members? How should we behave? How should we carry ourselves? This concept has been emphasized so much to the extent in the Qur'an and in the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in one hadith inna allaha lamma khalaqa rahim when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created family ties remember that is also a creation of Allah so when Allah created family ties Allah says to it Allah addresses it ana rahman Rahim. I am Rahman. I am the most gracious. And you are family ties. If you look at Rahman, the word Rahman, and you look at Rahim, both of them comes from the same root letters in Arabic. Raha and Meem. That is why the womb of the mother also in Arabic is called Rahim. Because... There is peace and mercy of a child in the womb of the mother. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana Rahman, I am Rahman wa anta Rahim. Asilu man wasalani. I will join those people together who join you, who make an effort to join you, who put you together, I will put them together. And I will sever and destroy those people who makes the effort to sever and destroy you. Another hadith the Prophet ﷺ tells us, Inna rahim bil arsh. That family ties, family ties are holding and hanging on to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To this throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it says every morning and every evening, family ties, every morning and every evening it says, Oh Allah, join those who join me, join those who join me. Yunadi al-layl wa naha every morning and every evening, Ya Rab, silman wasalani, wa qata'man qata'ani. Join those who make the effort in joining me and sever those who who make the effort in severing me. This is what it says every day. Now, look at this pristine teachings of our deen, Islam. How can a deen that has such pure, clean, and pristine ta'aleem and teachings, how, how is it possible that the, that the people who follow that deen, they have hatred in their hearts, they have animosity in their hearts for each other. How can this be possible? Whereby blood brothers are not talking to blood brothers. Sisters are not talking to sisters. Siblings are not talking to siblings. Parents are not talking to children. Children are not communicating with parents. 
How can this be possible? Our Islam teaches us something else. But today, we practice the opposite. If we look in the life of the Prophet wasallam, there are many examples cited whereby you will find that in Medina, in those days, there was no question in demanding one's right. There was no question in demanding your right, especially when it comes to family members. Today, something goes wrong between siblings. Everyone wants their right. Everyone asks for their rights. And if you, look, if you look at the first ever conflict that took place, the first ever conflict, it took place between two brothers, two family members, two brothers who drank milk from the same mother, who was taught by the same father, who was brought up by the same, the upbringing of the same parents, Habil and Qabil, the first conflict, the first argument that, that, that ever occurred in this ummah. That is why scholars have mentioned that majority of the quarrels and the arguments and the conflicts that will occur in this ummah will start first from families will start from family members. This is one of the root causes. But again, if you look into the life of the Prophet wasallam and the life of Sahaba in Medina, there were no question of demanding anyone's right. We are aware of a, a trying and a difficult period which Rasulullah wasallam passed through when his beloved wife Sayyidatuna Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was slandered on the accusation of adultery that was placed upon her. This was a very difficult time on the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a Nabi, as a husband. It was a very trying time for Sayyidina, for Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and uh, more than that, it was really a trying time for Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha. What kind of a personality she was? What kind of an individual she was? Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, she herself said, Allah has given me nine privileges in my life, which was not given to anyone other than me. Nine privileges were given to me, and these were not given to anyone other than me. Number one, لَقَدْ نَزَلَ جِبْرِيلْ بِسُورَةِ فِي رَاحِلَةِ My proposal in marrying the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came directly from Allah. Came directly from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent my suwar, my picture with Jibreel alayhi salam and informed the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this will be you're one of your spouses. First privilege that it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, لَقَدْ زَوَّجَتْنِي بِكْرًا وَمَا تَزَوَّجَ بِكْرًا I was the only wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was not married before. I was the only unmarried wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out of all his other 11 spouses. I was the only one. Number three, لَقَدْ تُوفِيَ She said that the Prophet ﷺ passed away from this world. He left this world while his blessed head was in my lap. Rasulullah ﷺ's head was in the lap of Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha when he passed away. That was the third privilege. The fourth, 70,000 angels comes every morning and every evening in my room to send salam on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is buried in my room. Wherever a nabi dies, that's where he is buried. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away in the hujra of Aisha radiallahu anha, and we all know that he is buried right there. And in that room, in that hujra, every day in the morning, seventy thousand angels descends to send salam on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in the evening, the same amount also descends. The, the fourth 
the fourth privilege that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he is buried in my room that was number five number six he said I I am the daughter of the successor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because Sayyidina Abu Bakr Radiallahu Anhu became the Khalifa after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so she said I am the daughter of the successor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the next one she said that the last thing that entered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's blessed mouth before he passed away was my saliva. My saliva was the last thing that entered the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How was this? Her brother Abdurrahman, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha's brother Abdurrahman radiallahu anhu, he came in to, to visit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he had a miswak in his pocket. A miswak, he had it in his pocket. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was glancing at the miswak. So Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked him, O oh, Prophet of Allah, do you need to use it? Rasulullah sallallahu was very particular in, in hygiene and especially in cleanliness of his mouth and teeth and so on. So he nodded his head because he, he didn't have the strength even to say yes. So she took it from, the, from her brother and she gave it to the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it was a little bit hard. So the Prophet ﷺ could not take it in his mouth and to make it soft. So she took it and put it in her mouth and made it soft for the Nabi of Allah ﷺ, after which the Prophet ﷺ used it. So the remaining saliva that was on the miswak, that was what entered the, 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 the stomach of the Prophet ﷺ before he passed away. And that was the last thing that ever entered his, his stomach. Then she said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divinely, divinely send the explanation of my modesty and my morality in the Quran that would be continued to be read by people till Qiyamah. In Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions her exoneration, where Allah exonerated her from, from the blame that she was blamed for. So her purity, her chastity, her haya is mentioned in Quran and, the, and we all will read it until Qiyamah. So such a personality who was accused of such a crime of adultery that one month has passed, which was a trying time, a testing period for them. As I mentioned earlier, one exact month. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat of Surah An-Nur in their exoneration or in her exoneration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very eloquently says in the Quran, and I, you know, if you understand this ayah, then your heart will burst. Allah says, "If talakkaunahu bi alsinatikum, wa taquluna bi afwahikum ma laysa lakum bihi ilm, wa tahsabunahu hayyina, wa huwa inda Allahi azim." What is the meaning of this? Allah is saying, what you are circulating, because they were circulating rumors about her. So Allah is saying now, what you are circulating about. The slandering of Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha and what you say about her making her immoral and what you are blurting about with no knowledge ma laysa lakum bihi ilm that you don't have any knowledge about what you say and you trivialize that crime you, th you take it and make it very simple wa huwa inda Allahi azim but in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that crime is a very severe crime it is what is the severe crime that you are spreading rumors of her na'udhu billah committing a, a, a heinous act. So this was, this was something that was very difficult for them to digest and to take in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exonerated her. On one occasion, within that month, that trying period, listen carefully. You know, she, she asked her father, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, she said, oh my father, defend me, defend my honor. Defend my innocence. You know for a fact, I am your daughter. You know who I am. I am the wife of your Nabi. I would not do something like that. That what I am accused for. Oh my dad, defend my honor. You know me. Every father knows his daughter. Every father knows his daughter. And every father has feelings for his children and especially his daughter. So she said, oh my dad, you know I am innocent. Why aren't you saying something in my innocence? Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu kept quiet. He kept quiet. He did not see anything. 
And then she mentioned this again to her that in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And again, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he kept quiet. So after Allah subhanahu wa taala exonerated her, and her innocence came out that she was innocent of of anything, she asked her father then, why didn't if if it was me, if it was you, we will leave no stone unturned to defend our child, and and because we know that our child is innocent. So we will go to lawyers and attorneys and do whatever is within our ability to make sure the name of the family has no stain, has no stain on it. So she asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Oh my dad, although you know that I was innocent, why didn't you say something in my innocence? So here was what, what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said. He said, Ayyu sama in tudilluni. Subhanallah. What words? He said, Which sky would have sheltered me and which earth would have bared my burden if in a dispute I had to utter something of which I had no knowledge of? Which sky would shelter me and which earth will take my burden if I say something? And all the facts are not in front of me. Maybe something is missing somewhere. And I tried to defend you, but everything is not there. Then which Allah, which Allah will help me? Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help me? This is what he said to his daughter, Aisha radiallahu anha. So he said, oh my daughter, I prefer to stay silent than to say something that I do not have the full, the, 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 uh, the full knowledge of. So... One of the persons, one of the persons who was involved in spreading this rumor about Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha was one of her relative. Was one of her relative. His name was Mistah radiallahu anhu. And he was also a Badri Sahabi. He was also a companion that participated in Badr, the first battle of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made open announcement of the forgiveness for all the Badriyin, right? But he was one of those who, you know, maybe by not knowing all the facts, he was the one who was somewhat involved, involved in, in, in spreading this rumor. So when Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha was exonerated, and before this, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to give him a monthly allowance. He used to give him a monthly allowance. Every month. So when Sayyidina, Bakr, when Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha was now exonerated and, 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 and she was free from any blame, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu swore now, he said, from today onwards, I will not give you anything anymore. Your allowance is now cut from me. Nothing for you. Because you're involved in something which could have been the defaming my daughter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayat of the Qur'an. Who was that person? A family member. What are we talking about? Family ties. How should we preserve family ties? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is telling Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, وَلَا يَأْتِئُ لِلْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّاعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا لِلْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينُ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَعْفُوا وَاسْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ With all that he did, with all that he did, what you need to do? What do you need to do? Allah is saying what you need to do, Farfu wasfahu. Forgive him and overlook. Would you be able to do that? Would I be able to do that? That someone spread rumors about my child, which I know was not true, and I am being told, forgive and forget? Put yourself in that place. It is a very bitter pill to swallow. Uh, we make sever relationships with that person our entire life and never ever talk back to him and may want to take him and to the cleaners and, and wipe him clean for what he did even though it may be a family member but what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying forgive and overlook why? don't you wish for Allah to forgive you? don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? so on hearing this on hearing this ayah, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu immediately, immediately acted upon it. Without reservation, 
If it was me, if it was you, we would, we would say, okay, let me still think about it. I need some time to think about it. It's too fresh. It's too difficult for me. Give me some time. No, no. But Sahaba were like that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals something from the Quran, immediately they would act upon it. So when this ayah came, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he immediately acted upon it and he called Mistah. He said, come. From today, before I used to give you one allowance. From this point onwards, I will double it. What did he say? Because Allah cautioned him. Allah cautioned him. From this point onwards, I will, I will double it. I will give you double the amount. And he said, why? I am doing this because I want Allah to forgive me. May Allah forgive you, but I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. So this is the extent where Islam tells us to go where family ties are concerned. Family ties are concerned. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he once addressed the Sahaba and he asked them, Ayyu urad Islam aw thaq? Oh my companions, oh my Sahaba, which binding rope of Islam is the strongest? Ayyu urad Islam aw thaq? Which is the strongest binding rope of Islam? Sahaba now they are giving the answers. Some of them said, as salah Ya Rasulullah, salah Salah is a very important pillar of Islam. This is the month of Rajab. Salah was what well, came down to Rasulullah in Rajab. Salah is the is the fun and the the, the 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 fundamental pillar of Islam, the middle pillar of Islam. Without salah, there was no Islam. It's like the head of the body and so on and so on. So Sahaba said the 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 the, the strongest binding rope of Islam is salah. Rasulullah said, Hasanatun wa ma biha. Yes, that's okay, but I'm not referring to that. That's not what I want. That's not the answer I'm looking for. So the Sahaba that said, Siyam or Ramadan. If it's not Salah, then it's, then it's fasting in Ramadan, which is coming up again very, very soon. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Hasanun, wa ma huwa bihi. That's good, fair and good. Fast in Ramadan, it's very good. But it's not, that's not what I'm referring towards. Sahaba then said, Jihadu fi sabilillah. O Prophet of Allah, then striving in the path of Allah. Striving in the cause of Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again said, Hasanun wa ma huwa bihi. That's also good. Very good. But that's not what I'm referring to. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now he gave the answer. He said, Inna awthaqa ur al-Islam an tuhib fillah wa tubghith fillah. An tuhib fillah wa tubghith fillah. One of the strongest binding rope of Islam is what? Is that you love someone. You appreciate someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it be your wife, whether it be your husband, whether it be your children, whether it be your brother, whether it be your sister, whether it be your kitten kins, whether it be your relatives, love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's for either, any other ulterior motive, it will not sustain. But if it is khalis there for Allah, it will sustain. وَتُبْغِذْ فِي اللَّهِ and you dislike, I don't like to use the word hate, you despise and you dislike someone's actions for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of Allah. So, my dear respected brothers and elders, one more hadith and I will, I, will, I will conclude because of time. And listen to this hadith carefully. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man ahabba an yumiddalahu fi umri. Anyone who would wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in his life. Who would wish for Allah to put barakah in his life? What is the meaning of barakah in a person's life? Does it mean that you, you are written to live for 60 years, but because of barakah in your life, Allah will increase it by 10 more years? No, no. One of the definition of this is that whatever actions a person used to do, listen carefully, whatever actions a person used to do during his lifetime, after he dies, after he dies, the rewards of those actions he will continue to receive in his qabr. The rewards and the thawab of those actions he will continue to receive in his grave. That's one of the definition of barakah. That you used to do things while you are alive. Now you are dead and you can't do it anymore. Allah will continue to make that reward goes in your, in your account. Right? So, one is... 
If you want Allah to put barakah in your, in your life, and secondly, and you wassalahu fi rizqi, and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah in your sustenance, in your risk, in your wealth, that to multiply it and make it more. Barakah in your wealth does not mean that you have one store and you go open two more, and you have changed stores and you say that's barakah. That's not barakah. That's the opposite of barakah. Barakah that you have one and you are contended and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making that suffices you and your family. Whereby you have contentment. And thirdly, that you are safe from a meter to sue, from an evil death, from a bad death. You are safe from that. What does that mean? That your name remain in the in the memory of people and in the eyes of people even after you're gone. People continue to remember you because of the good things you did in life, what you contributed to society, what you contributed to, to the building of Islam. What you did you do? That will remain alive. Look at Sahaba. Look at Sahaba. How many years ago? More than 1400 years ago. But we still talk about them today. And we'll still continue to talk about them until Qiyamah. Right? That is what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is honoring them. Allah is continue honoring them. And let me tell you something very uniquely. You know, Quran is such that, you know, if you take the word Qarun, Fir'aun, Haman, these are were enemies of Islam, big enemies of Islam. If you take their names just like that, then there is, you don't get any reward. It's just like taking any other person's name. I'm telling you, the enemies of Islam, their names. If you take their name just like that, you get no reward. But if you take their names while reading Quran, while reading Quran, you read wa Haruna wa, wa, wa Hamana wa Qarun and so on in the form of Quran, then for each letter in their name you get blessings. Subhanallah. Look how unique is that. For each letter in that name you get blessings. So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make a person's honor continue after he is gone and after he dies, that is protection from an, from, from an evil death. So the Prophet ﷺ says, anyone who would like these three things to be in his life, for Allah to put barakah in his life, for Allah to put barakah in his livelihood, and for Allah to save him from an evil death, then let him do two things. Two things. فَلْيَتَّقِلَّهِ Yattaqillah, fear Allah in observing your rights towards others. Wal yassil al rahim, and keep family ties going. Do not sever family ties. Keep your relations with your family. No matter you be the, the oppressed one, you be the oppressed one. Don't demand your rights. Allah will give you your rights, inshallah, on the day of qiyamah. What was the result? What was the result of the of the two brothers? Uh, uh, um, Habil and Qabil, quickly, what was the result? One of them was wrong, one was right. One of their sacrifice was accepted, one was not. The one whose sacrifice was accepted, it is said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him in such a way that when Ibrahim alayhi salam was told to slaughter his son Ismail alayhi salam and the, and the animal that was sent as a ransom for Ismail alayhi salam was the same animal that one of the brother presented for the uh, initial sacrifice. And it is said about the other brother who killed his brother, it is said that every killing, every unjust killing that takes place on earth, a portion of that sin will go in his account. A portion of that sin will go into his account. So we have two ways to choose. We have two ways to choose. Whether we demand our rights or we forego. Uh, like one of the brothers, what he did not demand his rights, he forego. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him in dunya and Allah will honor him inshallah in akhirah. So where family ties is concerned, if you have family members whereby you have to mend your relationships, make sure you do so before Ramadan comes. As I said in the beginning, do not enter into Ramadan whereby you have these these gaps of wrong being done from Rajab from now start 
correcting your deeds, start correcting your amal, start correcting your relationships with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other people so that you enter into Ramadan pure and clean. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar.